Welcome to the Collective Regional Summit presented by Community Trust Bank. Uh, we're back with the next sec session focused on the private sector perspective on economic development. Uh, this session offers insight from regional leaders about the impact of the ongoing pandemic on their operations, best practices in navigating COVID-19 environment, and uh, how they're innovating, adapting, and leading in a challenging time to ensure their businesses and uh, the community continues to pro prosper. Uh, our panelists joining us today, we have Wallace Barber. He's the owner of State Farm Insurance and Financial Services. Welcome, Wallace, glad to have you. He is from a remote location. Uh, we also have Wells Bullard. Hi, Wells, how are you? Uh, she's the CEO of Bullard, and also she's operating uh, with us from a remote location as well. And uh, Mary Quinn Raymer, president of Visit Lex, and she also is at a remote location. And finally, Lenny Rhodes, he's the CEO of Big Ass Vans, and he's here in the studio with me so that I would not be by myself. So <laughs> thank you, Lenny, You're for doing welcome. that. What we're going to do is I've got a series of questions that I'm going to ask uh, the different panelists, and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. So uh, let's start with Lenny. Uh, can you share how COVID-19 pandemic impacted your operations or customers and how you pivoted to address the ongoing challenges? Sure, Bob. So as you know, we're a local manufacturer. So we, we build all of our products right here in Lexington. Um, you know, we went from having a record first quarter to a precipitous drop in demand. And, and so, you know, we saw demand essentially evaporate. We sell primarily to manufacturers, distributors, a little bit of fitness, you know, all of their locations began to shut down. And, and so, you know, we had to take some immediate actions. And, and so we, we made some staffing reductions. We took some other expenses out. Um, we were thoughtful and deliberate about protecting our customer. So, so we were protecting the front end of the business. Um, one of the things that we were able to do is, is we really never took our foot off the accelerator around product because we knew that we would eventually get through um, this COVID situation and, and there would be life on the other side and, and we started to see life on the other side. We launched 15 new products, um, two of which were serendipitous for us. We had a couple of things under development. Um, so we have some technology now that we can adapt to our fans that will actually kill COVID, influenza A, B and other things. So, you know, we, we've got some opportunity coming out. We, we want this all to get behind us, but we really rethought sort of what did the organization need to look like both short and long term. Uh, we've been fortunate here through the, the back half of the year to actually be staffing back up. Um, and, and so we've been blessed to see demand begin yeah. to return. Um, on the customer side, you know, we, we've learned to engage differently with our customers now. We, we've primarily been a direct sales force, uh, largely over the phone. We've learned to be much more effective on Zoom. One of the, the hidden benefits for us has been we have a relatively long sales cycle. And as you think about that sales cycle, we talk to a plant manager. He has to talk to maybe his general manager, maybe a division president. In many cases now, we're able to get all of those constituents on a Zoom call all at one time. And, and so in some cases, we're actually seeing that sales cycle compress. And, and that's been a, another little hidden benefit for us. Wells, um, same question. Can you share how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your operations or customers and how you pivoted to address the ongoing challenge? Indeed. Uh, thanks, Bob. So we are also a manufacturer, uh, but we're a personal protective equipment uh, manufacturer. So PPE, which is now a household term. Um, so our uh, experience has been very different than a lot of other businesses. Hearing an echo. All right, I'll just keep going. Um, so anyway, so we protect workers in hazardous environments such as healthcare. And so we've had to change how we do almost everything with regard to, uh, you know, right from the very beginning with social distancing, uh, We've been very focused on number one, keeping our employees safe so that we can help protect workers in hazardous on. environments. Wells, so I think you're muted. We've taken that very seriously. Can you, sorry. I think you're muted. Can you hear me? <laughs> while, while, you're, muted. while you're checking on that, let's go to Wallace. Um, Wallace Barber, uh, same question. Can you share how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your operations or customers? and how you pivoted to address the ongoing challenges. And while you're answering that, we'll uh, allow the studio to work with uh, Wells here. Go ahead, Wallace. Okay, sure, sure. I, thanks, Bob. And, you know, it, it kind of impacted us where, you know, we normally have an office where we meet with our clients, you know, face to face. So that was probably the biggest impact where now we're doing a lot of our policy reviews and 
a lot of our uh, contact either via just phones or email. Um, you know, when people come to the office, if they do decide to come to the office, we just have it locked off uh, where they only can come just to the um, front lobby area. And then we just kind of uh, do everything as far as transactions through the, through the window that we have in front of our office. Um, of course, we, have, you know, we practice so the social distance in our office where um, we all kind of have our own office space and kind of keep separated from each other throughout the day. Um, so that's been some of the biggest impact um, as far as, you know, what we've been doing as far as pivoting from it. It's yeah. kind of changed the way we do our marketing. Um, you know, in the past, I was a big proponent, you know, as far as going door to door, as far as marketing to small business, other small business owners, uh, where now um, most of my marketing now is you know, phones, uh, buying maybe internet leads, mm -hmm. Or you know, making phone calls, sending out emails, mm -hmm. uh, those types of things. So it's a little different as far as the way I market to my small business owners. Um, but you know, as far as uh, you know, that's been the, that's probably the biggest impact is how we market and do our business moving forward. <laughs> Thank you uh, very much, and. Uh, Mary Quinn, same question as far as can you share how the COVID-19 pandemic impacted your operations and or customers and how you pivoted to address the ongoing challenges? Absolutely. Thanks, Bob. It's uh, good to be here today. And I'm speaking on behalf of the entire industry. So while we've had challenges um, at Visit Lex, we've also seen widespread challenges with the impact this pandemic has had on the hospitality industry. And I have said a lot lately that we have been devastated but not defeated. This pandemic has changed virtually everything about the way that we do business in the hospitality space. So the impact has been deep and significant. Um, I can tell you that in, here in Lexington, we've had 215 meetings or conventions cancel in this calendar year. That represents almost 100,000 room nights that our hotels did not realize. Um, this, of course, is just data that we're tracking at the city level. There's other room nights lost if you look at individual properties. And um, staggering statistic to share today, we are $105 million down in hotel room revenues in this city from mid-March through the 1st of December. So when I say that it has changed everything, I mean it has literally changed everything. As you know, many of our other partners, our restaurants and attractions were put on restrictions early on during the pandemic. Thankfully, folks are back online. Significant changes. We have pivoted to um, prioritizing the guest experience in a safe and um, healthy way. I think we see a lot more visual cues these days in hotels and at our attractions, um, bringing awareness to the cleanliness and the standards that are out there, and also trying to assure folks that they're going to be safe at their places of business. Um, that being said, we're looking at a pretty um, dire next three months as the winter, um, as it gets colder and folks are forced to be indoors more, it poses a lot of challenges. And so the news of the vaccine is by far have been the bright spot of 2020 for this industry. Well, I have to say, Mary Quinn, you have been one of the most incredible champions and I don't know when you sleep. Uh, I just know every time I turn around, you're on the go uh, working and working. Uh, and it, you've been a great partner with us as well. So thank you. Um, Wells, I think we have you back now. <laughs> so uh, uh, again, the question was, how does, how can, can you share how COVID-19 pandemic impacted your operations or, and our customers and how you pivoted to address the ongoing challenges? Absolutely. I mean, so yes, yeah, so obviously, so we are, manufacturer of personal protective equipment. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great, sorry. Uh, of personal protective equipment. And so the pandemic has had a very different impact on our business in that uh, all of a sudden we saw just a very chain, a very big change in the mix. So we make powered air purifying respiratory protection that protects pharmaceutical manufacturers and other workers and also was essential for some frontline healthcare workers responding to COVID-19. So we just saw a very big mix shift in our business and really uh, did all that we could to increase the capacity in order to meet all the demand there that we possibly could to be able to protect as many people as possible. 
And our focus has been very singular on keeping our employees healthy and safe to the in order to protect as many people as possible. And uh, so we've had to change basically, I mean, kind of what Lenny was saying earlier is we've had to change basically everything that we do. So we have to, uh, we implemented social distancing, cleaning protocols, hand washing breaks. We eliminated any sort of mix of um, employees as much as possible from shifts. And so we've had to uh, balance all of that in order to keep again, our employees safe so that they can keep other workers safe. Um, the other big pivot that we've had is we actually were uh, able to, in a matter of weeks, we went from development design to manufacture of a new healthcare face shield in order to protect healthcare workers uh, with more personal protective equipment. And that was pretty incredible. Um, the call to serve was very loud and um, our engineers and our manufacturing team and our supply chain team, everybody really worked together with customers in order to get that to market in a matter of weeks versus months. Um, and so that was pretty incredible. Very creative. There's been a lot of activity in operating uh, as safely as possible to continue to protect workers. Uh, excellent. And, you know, the next question is, what changes in operations do you think are here to stay? And we'll start with Wallace. Um, I think the biggest thing is uh, we're going to probably see more of our clients, you know, do business virtual. You know, we have, you know, we used to do a lot of our business face to face. Um, but now we don't see a lot more of our clients um, that they want to or not we have to just do a lot of our business virtual, whether it's making payments, signing documents, doing policy reviews. Um, everything's going to basically be, um, I think, in our, in, our, in our side, virtual. And you're going to see probably more um, of our team members and employees working more from home um, more than in the past as well. Yes. Mary Quinn, same question. If you uh, about your hotel experience, typically you um, didn't necessarily want to see the house coming, uh, housekeeping cart come rolling down the hall. And now I think you're going to be very accustomed to seeing all kinds of cleaning protocols in a very sort of front of the house kind of way. I think people love that visual assurance that they're being well taken care of and, and that the place of business has a serious commitment to your safety and, and your wellness. I also think that you will have, um, you'll continue to see great effort in the technology to make your transactions fairly seamless and very um, reliant on your phone for checking in, paying your bill, leaving your tip, all the things that we've gotten accustomed to. One of the great sort of highlights, and there have been some highlights for, from 2020 for our industry, is that we had so many small restaurants that had never virtu ventured into um, doing takeout or, or being sophisticated with their technology and that has shifted tremendously. So you've probably, if you've been out to eat, notice the QR codes where you can pull up your menu. That saves expense, um, obviously, and the quick changes that come with whatever's seasonal and fresh that day. And it allows um, folks to not have to have their fingers on many, um, many menus during the, during the visit. So I think there are going to be some things for sure that will be here to stay. But I think the biggest priority you'll see from the hospitality space will be those visual signs that the clean, cleaning standards are exceptional and that you are in an environment that's taking your wellness very seriously. Yeah, absolutely agree. Uh, Lenny. So, so I think much like Wallace, I think how we interact with customers is going to change. I think sort of learning to be effective digitally. Yeah, you know, we started off and we sort of would take the same presentation that we would have given face to face and we would put it on Zoom. And, and we've learned you know, over the last few months that there's a way to conduct an effective Zoom. There's a way to conduct business digitally that that's very effective and, and can be very productive. I, I don't think travel will stop much to, to Mary Quinn, you know, at least one opinion to one. I think people will still travel, but I, I think sort of particularly follow on meetings, your know, training meetings and sessions like that. I, there, there's some really interesting digital tools that I think we've all learned that, that we will continue to use that, that's making us productive on the manufacturing side and then our customers more productive with their time uh, on their end. And, and I think that'll stick around. Uh, Wells, how about you? Yeah, I think that the virtual engagement is absolutely here to stay. And I think one thing that we've seen, uh, Mary Quinn was talking about, bright spots 
is we've been able to reach so many more people. So Lenny was just mentioning training. And when you're doing a training uh, uh, class or whatever, you can actually reach so many more people at the same time in a virtual setting than if you're trying to get everybody into one location. Uh, and so I think that we'll be leveraging that for a long time. And, and much like Lenny just uh, shared, uh, obviously we've learned a lot in terms of how we do engage because again, ours was so face-to-face -face before and that relationship building in person. And now we're translating that to a digital era, but it definitely there's some efficiencies uh, in terms of being able to be in multiple customer visits, especially for those follow-ons and for that training that you can be a lot more efficient. Uh, and I can go you know, to a meeting in Asia and a meeting in Europe back to back uh, without getting on a plane. Uh, travel will absolutely uh, be important as we move forward, but it'll be just different how we leverage that. And then I'd also say that there's been um, some pretty interesting uh, learnings we've had with regard to how can we creatively solve problems uh, in a tighter time schedule, right? How can you really, uh, what's the power of focus, right? When you have a singular mission, when you're trying to protect healthcare workers in a global pandemic, how do you get all the resources together to be able to do that in a shorter time frame uh, while still meeting standards and, and exceeding performance requirements and things like that. So I think that there's definitely some learning from that um, and some great collaboration with supply partners, uh, supply chain partners, and also with other industry, uh, other industry people who could actually help us to do that. So I hope that we carry that forward as well. So next question, beyond the pandemic, what do you see as the top issues or I issue or issues or challenges facing your business or industry sector or our region as it relates to economic development. And uh, Mary Quinn, let's start with you. Uh, well, Bob, I think for us, we're gonna, um, we're gonna be rebuilding an industry, so to speak. And as Wells was talking, I was just sitting here thinking about how much has changed about the business traveler, which as you know, for the airlines and for many hotels was the lifeline, um, you know, the sort of bedrock that kept everything moving. So we've got a lot of changes that we know are coming. I do think that travel will be back, not just leisure travel, but also business travel and um, group travel, the, the idea of gathering together for a convention. And so I, um, as you know, in Lexington, we are undergoing a massive renovation expansion of our convention center. One of the other um, sort of silver linings of 2020 has been that we've been able to accelerate our timeline on the completion of that facility. We will be fully open to the public in January of 2022. I actually think that could be very good timing for us. I think people will be chomping at the bit to get back together in person when we um, are on the other side of this pandemic. And so I think focusing on our group business and how we leverage this brand new asset that is really going to be state of the art um, I think is going to be a big focus for us in this industry moving forward. I also think that we, um, Lexington has been the beneficiary of being a mid-sized city that was gaining attraction. And there was quite a bit of momentum going into this year. Um, of course, we were able to do Breeders' Cup this year, but not the way that we wanted to. So we'll be having uh, the opportunity to host that again in 2022. And uh, assuming that we can help as many of these small businesses survive, I think we have the opportunity to present in a, a really authentic, genuine travel experience for folks. And I think that there's gonna be great leverage for the fact that we are not a super metropolitan area, that we do have plenty of wide open spaces, that we have experiences that allow you to authentically connect with what it is that makes this place so special. So I have great optimism about the future of travel, specifically here in Lexington and the Bluegrass region. And I think that we've got a lot of things that will be strong selling points for us um, on the other side of this pandemic. Well said, Lenny. The, the thing that, that I worry about, Bob, I, I've got a number of, of working parents and, and, and I really worry about what's happening with their children. I have a sophomore in high school. Um, you know, sort of what are the long-term carry-on effects with respect to our education system, basically at every level. Um, you know, it's, it's creating a lot of stress for parents right now with schools being closed, which, which, you know, has got its own set of problems. But then, you know, what's going to happen, you know, with high schoolers right now, middle schoolers, college, tech school. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, we're, we're going to have, you know, a, a group of folks that are, that are going to lose a year or more 
and, and sort of how do we regain that? How do we engage those people? How do we engage yeah. the kids coming out of high school, out, out of college? Uh, how do we get the kids in high school prepared for college, prepared for tech schools? And, and, and I haven't seen a lot of discussion about that, right? I think uh, a lot of folks are sort of putting their heads in the sand about what's going on with regards to the the education system broadly, and, and, and it's not necessarily a central Kentucky problem, but I think if we can figure that out in a good way, I, I think it could give us a real advantage. But 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 I do see it, you know, up close and personal with my own child, and and then with with the folks that that work with me, and and, and that one that one gives me pause. Yeah, and we're hearing more and more of that. Uh, no surprise, and I think we're hearing it globally. Uh, it's not just a local issue, but again, as we always say, it's. You know, it's not what you hear, it's what you do going forward to uh, make corrections and adjustments. Uh, Wallace, um, same question beyond the pandemic. What do you see as the top issues or challenges facing your business or industry sector or our region as it relates to economic development? Yeah, one of the biggest challenges that I think we'll face, especially in our office, is that, you know, for so long we pride ourselves on having the face-to-face -face interaction, uh, being out in the community, and like uh, Barry Quinn mentioned, you know, but not having a lot of these community events, those are opportunities for me to get out, shake hands, see people, greet people, you know, and establish those relationships. Uh, you know, Bob, I've been a member of the chamber for a number of years, like those business links we used to have. That was a great opportunity for me. I was, you know, when I first started, I mean, that's kind of how I built my business was going around the different community events, meeting people, shaking hands, giving out business cards, I uh, get a chance for them to see me have face-to-face -face interaction. So that's gonna be the biggest challenge moving forward. How do I reach those people that I used to reach on a regular basis that now I don't get a chance to see and where now it's more just, you know, sending out, you know, trying to be active on social media, you know, those types of things where I, where I can kind of engage people on social media that way, they can hopefully see me in, in that aspect as opposed to seeing me in the face-to-face -face environment that we used to have. Yeah, well said. Um, Wells. Yeah, so that's very interesting what Wallace uh, just shared. So I think that there is kind of a move in this post-pandemic world to uh, more local. So again, obviously, as a manufacturer, uh, local sourcing, right? Sourcing that's a little bit closer. Um, how do you how do you kind of eliminate the risk or some risk of being so far away from supply chain sources and stuff like that? And why I think that hits what you were saying, Wallace, is it also goes to this like awareness in the bluegrass of how are we aware of each other, right? How are bluegrass uh, uh, companies and organizations, how are we aware of each other and what skills and talents that we each have? And how do we do that? Uh, again, maybe meeting first time in a virtual way, or eventually we will be in person again, and we will be shaking hands and giving hugs and things like that. Uh, and how do we make sure that there's that awareness and that, I don't know, Kentuckians are bettering Kentucky and bettering other Kentuckians, right? So there might be an opportunity for us as we come out of that in that way. Um, the other thing that I was, that I kind of thought about with this question was um, also along the lines of education, going a different um, route than what Lenny was talking about is, I think there's a great opportunity for us to try to work on how do we retain talent in the bluegrass? Right? So how do we retain and attract the best talent? And I think that we've got a lot of great educational entities across the bluegrass. And so I definitely am looking for as much collaboration as possible between the universities, the technical colleges, other vocational schools um, and employers in the state, because I think that's really gonna be our secret sauce. Some of the things that, that Mary Quinn was talking about of what makes the bluegrass so attractive and what makes uh, Lexington and Central Kentucky so attractive to people is again, mid-sized city, it's beautiful. There is space, um, there's great food, there's fun things to do, um, but how do we then attract and develop that local talent and then keep them here, right? And so how do companies and other organizations interact with all of the great educational uh, entities that exist around here in order to create those opportunities and develop in-state talent and then keep it here well said and you know uh, this this is a private uh, yes go ahead sorry to, so to interject one thing that i neglected to mention but i do feel like it is really important because it in, involves everybody that's probably listening and certainly on this panel um, one threat that i do worry quite a bit about is our airlift our airlines obviously have suffered tremendously during this pandemic 
We are a regional airport. We have a fantastic team out of the Bluegrass Airport. We are very blessed for a city our size to have the number of daily flights. Um, if we don't see additional relief out of Congress, I think we run a real uh, existential threat about lo losing some of those daily flights and that impacts our business community in significant ways. So I just, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned that because it is extremely important and a, and a legitimate threat on the other side of this. Yes, it is Thank extremely you. important. Yeah, very good point. You know, th this is a pri private sector perspective and, um, you know, in the private sector, we don't know the county lines, the city lines, what we know uh, our market lines, you know, markets, and those are broad and much further. And so um, this kind of comes back to the question, what do you see as opportunities for better regional collaboration to advance the bluegrass economy? So from your all's perspective, again, you know, county and city lines are one thing that's, you know, kind of broken out for purposes of the government, but for us, we go a lot broader. So again, how would you see better uh, opportunities for better regional collaboration? And let's start with uh, Lenny. I, I, I would reflect a little bit on, on what Well said. I, I think, you know, as I think about how we recruit and, and sort of how we think about it, it's easy to get myopic. And, and so I think it starts with what we do. And, and if we look into that, that larger region, when I look at, at where folks that work for us live, you know, it, it's certainly not within five miles of, of the manufacturing facility, right? Absolutely. So we have a, a much bigger footprint than what we realize. And, and so I think, you know, as we think about recruiting, you know, it starts, it starts right there. Um, you know, I, I like to think that we do a pretty good job, you know, all things being equal, taking care of people once we get them in the door and, and they're gonna wanna stick around. But, you know, how do, we, how do we cast that net and make sure we hit the right, you know, whether it's high schools, vocational schools, technical schools, and, and frankly, even colleges, right? It, it's easy yes. to, to forget about, you know, EKU right down the road, uh, a hop, skip, and a jump from, from my corporate headquarters. Um, and we've, we've got some good people out of there. They've got some good safety programs. And, and so I think as, as, as folks within the, the community, as leaders, as we learn more about what's right in our backyard, mm -hmm. and, and there's some very good talent, it's, just, it's easy to get busy and, and not pay attention to it. Mm -hmm. and, and, and so I would, I would really echo what Well said on you know, making sure that, that we, we look you know, close to home first, but before we, we go yeah. further outside and further afield. And, and, and we're starting to do some of that. I, I, I echo, and what Wells and I know, we talk about some of this, I, I echo you know, sort of her sentiments on this 110%. Yeah. Wells, would you add to that in any way? Uh, I'm afraid I don't have much to add, um, <laughs> except yeah, I think that just uh, how do we how do we help each other? I mean, it really goes to how do we work with again? There's so many colleges and technical schools and all of this educational uh, uh, entities in just the nearby region and keep expanding. And how can we work together? And how can we give those students great opportunities to learn on the job. How do we also make sure that we're expanding our reach uh, there? And then I, I just go back to the whole idea of how can we all help each other? How can we connect? How can uh, organizations and entities in the bluegrass, how do we know about each other and see what we can do to help uh, uh, promote each other's services and capabilities as well? Now, Mary Quinn, you've touched on this in several different ways, but again, the same question, how do you see, what do you see as opportunities for better regional collaboration to advance the economy, the bluegrass economy? Sure. Well, Bob, if the private sector doesn't care about county lines, I can assure you that the visitor does not care about county <laughs> lines. They're very confused by the fact that we have so many counties to begin with. <laughs> Um, so actually, we've had a little bit of a head start on this collaborative approach because just take, for example, Lexington. If you're overnighting and you are interested in bourbon distilleries, we, of course, have two, um, actually three or four uh, distilleries, if you include our craft partners, in our downtown core. But a couple of heritage brands that are extremely well known, take Woodford Reserve, for example, or Four Roses or Wild Turkey, those are about a 30 minute drive from Lexington. You would never think twice about it. So we would be silly to miss that opportunity to promote and to market Wild Turkey and Four Roses and Woodford Reserve as a part of the Lexington experience. And so we have been doing some of that regional marketing for many years because we realize that we have the opportunity to extend the stay and get you to be in town longer if we take into account the full offerings that present themselves in the Bluegrass region. I certainly think that we can do more of that. And I think in our industry specifically, we've got a real opportunity to do a much better job cross-promoting and packaging those experiences. 
Of course, um, travel is one of those things that you want to be easy. You don't want to have to think a lot about it because typically you're doing it for a little bit of rest and relaxation. So to be able to have those those experiences packaged in a way that makes it very easy for the consumer to purchase. I think that's a real opportunity for us in our collaborative efforts moving forward. And uh, finally, uh, Wallace. Yeah, um, I think Lenny and Wells kind of said it all. I mean, um, I really have a whole lot too much to add on to that as we always kind of, you know, kind of help each other. Um, I guess one thing about in our business, what I'm doing is that, you know, a lot of us, we're, we're licensed to market and promote our business across the state. You know, most of, you know, of course, the majority of our business is in our local area, but we can market across the state. But it's just, um, you know, we just kind of help each other across the state is kind of what we do as far as, um, you know, biggest thing we do here is just trying to expand, you know, most of the social media now is trying to you know, trying to expand and reach more people that way. Next question. So where do we as community leaders need to be focused to help provide the support or policy changes uh, that are needed to make sure your business and your customers continue to grow? And you might want to add, in, I'll add into that, gaps of things that we're missing out on that we need to do a better job of. But again, the question is, where do we as community leaders need to be focused to help develop um, the support or policy changes needed to make sure your business, your customers continue to grow. So Lenny, we'll start with you. Sure, I mean, I, I don't know that I have any uh, silver bullets on that, but one, one of the things that I will say I appreciate about the Commonwealth is, is both on the federal and state level, our, our representatives to Congress are very open and, and very willing to listen to us. And, and I think generally speaking, uh, are pretty pro-business. And, and so to the extent that, that we reach out to them and, and we have sort of a, a clear and consistent message about what is important to us. We, we do have federal and state representation that I found very willing to, to listen and, and to do what they can to, to advance a sort yeah. of pro-business and, and a healthy economic environment for us. Now, I mean, there's stimulus and all kinds of things that are out there, but, but both yeah. at the federal and state level, I, I would encourage folks to not be shy to reaching out to the local representation. And, and from your standpoint, you haven't seen any gaps or places that we need to do a better job on the relief side? <laughs> yeah. um, it, the relief side's been a mixed bag, right? I, I worry a lot about the hospitality industry. I worry about restaurants. You know, I, I think yeah. that giant unemployment subsidies are, are actually counterproductive. You know, we, we had issues getting people to come back to work, right? And, and literally yeah. telling us that it's, it, it makes more sense for me too. to be on, <laughs> on unemployment. Well, that yeah. was true until it ran out and, and, and yeah. then, you know, sort of last man standing. But I think, you know, Mary Quinn talked about the airlines. I worry about airlines, um, you know, sort of on the local level. Yeah. And, and, and I certainly worry about sort of restaurants and hospitality. So I think some targeted efforts there, yeah. um, you know, probably make sense. Yeah. Uh, Mary Quinn. Well, Lenny just set me up perfectly because we <laughs> have quite a bit, we have a long list of needs in our industry right now. And actually there is a push, as you know, uh, we've got the congressional leadership convening this week and working on the federal budget, but the, there's also a um, chance, and I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic that we might be able to see some relief come out of their work this week in DC. And it, it quite frankly can't come soon enough. Uh, really this is the life and uh, it's a, sort of a life and death difference here for many of these small businesses um, to survive. And, and there are several things that I would just highlight as a part of that. Um, you know, we know that we've got leisure down, uh, domestic business travel is down significantly, international travel is basically all but evaporated this year. And so that has a very compounding impact on our industry. So um, specifically on our need list for Congress right now is to expand the PPP program through the end of 21 to also expand eligibility of that program, provide additional emergency assistance to our airlines and our airports. This is key again, as I mentioned, for Lexington retaining the number of daily flights that we have and, and the markets that we're currently able to access with one flight and to extend and enhance the coronavirus relief fund into 2021. Um, Governor Bashir obviously recently opened up a program for our restaurant partners that was made available through those CRF funds. If that evaporates, then we're not able to do much at the state level to kick that money out to folks that really need it. 
There's one other um, item that I would mention, and that has to do with troubled debt restructuring that has given safe harbor to many of our hoteliers in this very difficult year. As, as you know, uh, occupancy levels are significantly down. Average daily rates are down. We've had our hotels scraping by. Uh, people think oftentimes that these are big corporations, but many of the hotels that you find in Lexington are affiliated with a national chain, but are run by small um, business uh, franchises. And so for them to have access to um, protection and uh, to be able to work with their banks on their payments. We do. We know that the next three months for at, le at least the next three months, maybe the next six months are going to continue to be very hard on our hotels. And we really need um, that troubled debt restructuring protection that has been available up until the end of this year. Hopefully that will get extended as well. So those are a few of the things that I think are immediate for our industry. And again, um, you know, we'll have to make sure, I, I agree with Lenny wholeheartedly that in terms of this district, we've got great access and support from Congressman Barr, got a good relationship with the governor's office as well as our two senators. And we have been in regular communication with them. I do think they understand that the need is real and um, immediate in this industry. So I'm grateful for their commitment to Kentucky. Yeah, I think uh, Lenny and Mary Quinn said it well. We are very fortunate with our elected officials. Uh, we've had direct access all the way through, and they've been very responsive, Even their staffs have been uh, easy to work with. So, again, fortunate for us. I don't think that's the case uh, all over the place. But uh, also the same question, um, uh, Wallace. Yes. Um, I think having meetings like this and having open dialogue is the first step, you know, just kind of see what different industries are needing, just kind of listen to Lenny and also listen to uh, Mary Quinn's. You know, we got some great restaurants and small business around here, especially the hospitality industry. Um, you know, the PPP was great. And I think also, um, I think the small business grant that the uh, chamber had this year was great. I mean, it helped me out a lot. It allowed me to um, hire an additional staffing and kind of get me on the hump for this year as well to keep keep everything rolling um but you know like the others mentioned i mean that funding is help it helps a lot but you know it helps as far as getting us over the hump and we also just need to support each other you know i think that's the biggest thing just continue to help and support small businesses uh whether it's the restaurants uh you know hospitality all of us here we all just need to support each other as far as helping us all get over the hump, you know, as far as internet, get, getting past this stage here. Yeah. Well, did you have anything to add to that or you want to go on to the next question? Yeah, I think the only thing uh, that I would add there is definitely I agree that uh, know, my father always said that Kentucky is big enough to do things and small enough to get things done. So I think that that experience of having access to officials who really want to listen and understand uh, what challenges we have. I would say that the one thing uh, that Lenny brought up earlier about the schools, right? So obviously there's the economic uh, relief that needs to be addressed that I think Mary Quinn <laughs> described very well here. Um, but one of the biggest challenges for our employees has also been childcare uh, with school in terms of the schools closed and our employees uh, being tasked with basically an impossible task of trying to educate their kids while maintaining a very challenging work, you know, situations and trying to be very creative at work and stuff. And we just need to figure out how to uh, how to make that work because we've got, I think we're going to see, we, we have seen around the country and we will continue to see, especially a lot of women dropping out of the workforce in order to take care of the families. So I think there's something there that needs to be addressed so that we, uh, we help uh, families uh, get through things like this. Excellent insights, uh, all of you. A question from one of our, uh, from our listening audience. What COVID relief initiatives or loans did each of you apply for and were the programs helpful? Uh, and Mary Quinn, I'm gonna start with you because I know one of your frustrations has been their lack of, of um, support uh, from a federal level just because of your tax identification. Right, so at VisitLex, which is the uh, tourism office for the city, we are a quasi-governmental entity, and I don't think it was malicious, but we fell between the cracks. So we have been to date ineligible for any relief dollars that have been made available. 
that is very hard because even though we do um, fund our operations through the transient room tax collected on overnight hotel stays, in many ways we, we function like a small business. And we certainly have been looked to by the industry to help bring us out of this, um, you know, very challenging year hard without having any relief dollars. So I have great hopes that if there is a second round of PPP that um, destination marketing organizations like mine, which are quasi-governmental, and uh, 501c6 organizations like Commerce Lexington will find themselves eligible. I would also just mention that for many of our restaurant partners, the PPP was made available to them in a time um, when they were actually shut down. If you'll recall, we weren't really doing much um, in the way of restaurant business back in the spring when the PPP first came out. So it's hard to pay your staff when you don't have staff working. You maybe had a couple of cooks in and someone there to you know handle the takeout, but you just didn't have your full team in. So many of them missed that opportunity as well. Um, our hotels did benefit immensely from uh, accessing PPP and some of the other uh, small business loans that have been made available. But as I mentioned, they really have been saved by this troubled debt restructuring program that has protected them and, and allowed them to work with their banks. And that is set to expire at the end of December. And so um, expanding that or taking that into 2021 would be hugely um, beneficial for them. And then, of course, the airlines, uh, you know, there was emergency relief provided to them. It was supposed to and great hope for additional relief in early October. Unfortunately, being an election year, that didn't happen. It kind of got lost in the flurry of, of you know, October timing and, and close to election day. So we need some additional relief um, from them as well. I, I, there was obviously a lot that came out. It was uh, historic in the sense of um, the amount that was put out there, but for this industry in particular, um, there's just quite a bit more need that's out there. Yeah. Wells. Um, yeah, so we were, uh, we were able to uh, procure a PPP loan as a small business and that allowed us to protect workers' jobs. I mean, that's really, uh, what we had and in terms of the ease of the process, I think uh, we had partners that helped us get through the process well and we found it, uh, we were very, very lucky that we uh, were organized and got in there very early. Um, but that's what we've used it for is protecting our employees. Excellent. Lenny? So we, we were also ineligible for most federal aid for, for opposite reasons for, than what Mary Quinn experienced. So as a, as a private equity owned organization, mm -hmm. We, we were excluded from the vast majority of, of programs, so, so we didn't take advantage of, yeah. weren't able to take advantage of, of any of the programs. Yeah. Wallace? Yes, yeah, so I was able to um, apply and get the uh, PPP loan, um, you know, not to plug a local bank, but I had a local banker that kind of helped me through that process. You know, it went for him, you know, I probably missed out on that and, um, because I think I learned later on, I think 90% of minority-owned business businesses missed out on that uh, PPP loan. Uh, so, so kudos to to uh, you know to my local banker that I had to kind of kept me in the loop and and stay with me and and we kind of worked through that process. And then I think I received some funding from the I think the chamber had some funding out there as well. Um, and a lot of times I just kind of learn about it online or just through network of friends. I think Facebook had one that, that was, I mean, missed out on that one. I think it had a whole lot of hoops and hurdles to go through to try to get that one. Um, and like I said, I use that money to kind of keep this thing afloat as far as uh, I brought on additional um, employees that was, 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 uh, was got laid off somewhere. So I brought him on board. Uh, so use that, that funding to to, you know, to get me through the year, um, you know, kind of, you know, cut into my personal revenue, but, but hey, I just want to make sure, you know, everybody was taken care of here and then want to, then want to lay off anyone to make sure we continue, you know, throughout the rest of the year. Yeah. And I want to give uh, credit, <laughs> I want to give credit to where credit's due. Um, the $2.5 million grant fund that you applied and got funds for came out of the Lexington Fed Urban County Council discussions and, so the city put that forward, working together, and that was a tremendous aid to a lot of to a lot of businesses. Uh, another question from our listening audience, and that is, how is your business projecting what to expect for revenue 
or growth in 2021, how are you approaching your budget process for 2021? Let's start with Wells. Lucky me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so we're uh, in the thick of this right now. Yeah, I mean, there's a great deal of uncertainty out there. So how we're approaching it is, uh, again, we're 122 years old. We're fifth generation family owned. We are looking beyond just the next quarter or year or 10 years um, into the future. And so we are looking at 2021 as a very uncertain year where we are trying to control what we can control and uh, build into our budgets what we know to be true, what we know to be possible, and then um, making sure that we're making really smart decisions to, uh, to resource our business so that we not just get through 2021, but get into 2022 even stronger. So I don't know if that's the right answer, but I mean, there's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of, um, you know, a lot of just uh, engaging a lot with our customers to make sure that we understand what are the challenges facing them. Um, you might imagine emergency responder budgets. Uh, we sell firefighting equipment, uh, helmets and thermal imaging cameras. And those budgets are very, uh, again, like a lot of other organizations, very challenged. And so just uh, knowing what we can know and estimating what we can't, and then just uh, building our business plan so that we are stronger getting out of this pandemic than we were entering, hopefully. Yeah, well said. Lenny? So, so we actually think that next year is going to be, uh, relatively speaking, a good year. So we're, we're planning for a, a, a modest sort of single-digit increase. We think there's a lot of factors. Wells mentioned, as, as we look at, you know, we're primarily U.S. You know, organizations like Bullard that, that look to maybe source things a bit closer to home uh, could be good for our business. We, we had an aggressive new product calendar, so we've got a lot of new products uh, entering into some new segments that, that we think are going to be good for us. Again, we, we try to protect the customer through all this. And then, you know, frankly, for us, one of the, the big drivers for our business is sort of warehousing distribution. E-tailing is very good for us. You know, these big distribution centers, they, they tend to employ a lot of folks. They tend to be hot and they tend to be fan customers. We're going to be careful. Um, we're, we're going to be thoughtful, but, you know, we, we look at sort of by the second quarter, which is when we really, you know, saw the, the lockdowns and, and, you know, the maybe accepting the restaurant business where we're really widespread. We, we think that between vaccine and, and just, you know, sort of us all learning to adapt, um, that, that we think economic conditions are, are, are going to get better. And, yeah. and so we, we are cautiously optimistic. Yeah. Um, Wallace. Yeah, as Lenny and Wells mentioned, um, yeah, we're planning for a big year next year. I, mean, I just finished my budget and my planning, um, you know, just last week. And, you know, we worked extremely hard this year, and I figured we can keep that same level of momentum going into next year. Um, and I think it's, go it's going to get better. And so I think the business was able to plow through this and and keep, keep the um, – pedal to the metal as long as they can, uh, I think they're going to benefit on the, on, the, on the other side of this. Um, you know, I think similar to like, I guess the uh, real estate mortgage bust in 08, you know, it seemed like a few of the eight real estate agents that I knew back then who kept plugging away and plugging away and kept at it. They were the ones, somebody that really benefited on the other side of that whole mortgage um, and real estate bust in 08. So, that's kind of my approach to it this time around as well. I'm just going to continue just to press forward. Um, you know, we you know we already looked at our numbers for next year, and we're just going to try to try our best to to meet those numbers, meet those goals, and and try to keep that same marketing level we have this year, and keep that going for next year as well. Mary Quinn. Well, as Wells said, there's such uncertainty. It's hard to know exactly how to build a budget for 21. That being said, I don't think anyone in the hospitality industry is expecting anything magic to happen in Q1 or Q2. I do think there is optimism about the third and fourth quarters. There is a really strong relationship between traveler sentiment and vaccine distribution. And so if we see in the spring that vaccine distribution is going well, and that people are feeling more confident, I think you will see traveler sentiment follow very closely. I think people really are chomping at the bit to get back out on the road, but I think they want to feel safe doing so. And so the vaccine has a, a huge piece, um, it is a huge piece of that puzzle. 
Uh, that being said, I did have the opportunity last week to listen in to a national economist who, who specializes in the hospitality industry talk about the fact that we are probably looking at 2024, 2024 before we are back to pre-pandemic levels um, in this industry, specifically as it relates to rates at the hotels. So it's very easy and for rates to go down quickly, but it takes much longer to build those back. So we still have got, you know, a couple of years really and truly in the thick of um, recovery and rebuilding that we will have to do in order to get ourselves back to pre-pandemic levels. That being said, I do feel like there is some cautious optimism toward the third and fourth quarters. So at Visit Lex, we are going to be working on a 90-day cycle because it's hard to do much more than that. I mean, we kind of have a an idea for the year, but in, in practical terms, and because we are small and are able to do so, we really are living in a 90-day window because it's hard to do much else. Yes. Uh, one other acknowledgement I want to give on the $2.5 million grant, uh, credit goes where credit's due. Preston Worley was a council member who really spent a lot of time uh, figuring all that out that helped so many people across the community. So I just wanted to give uh, him and, and Amanda Bledsoe, uh, who also was very active, but with the whole council, uh, you know, in, in difficult times, the creative people step forward and uh, and make things happen, and they, they certainly did. So I've got uh, one specific question for Mary Quinn, and then I want you all to just, uh, for kind of a final wrap up, just real quickly to kind of say that one or two things that, that might sum up some of your overall thoughts on this. But Mary Quinn, uh, what can we do to help local restaurants, retail, and tourism attractions during this time? I, and I'm telling I'm you, so every, glad. everywhere I go, everywhere I go, that's what you hear. I'm so glad that you asked. It was going to be my wrap up, so I'll just go. <laughs> You're starting us off. Now. Yeah. Yes. You're going to hear a lot of my voice over the next few weeks because we just got a, a campaign that we're launching via social media, but also TV and radio. And, and here's the message loud and clear. We need your help. We need you to order takeout. We would love it if you would actually go pick it up instead of having it delivery, delivered by a third party because uh, Grubhub and, and organizations like that really take a tremendous cut off of what our restaurants are making. So if you're in a position to order takeout and go pick it up, that would be huge. We would love for you to shop local this holiday season. It might take a little bit more effort. You might have a few more stops, but I personally have made this commitment to buy as much as I can from local um, retail shops. And it has been great fun getting out and uh, connecting with people that are really the lifeline of this industry. We need for you to book a staycation. I know that if you live here, you might not think about staying in a hotel very often, but it can be a very fun way to get away even if it's just for a weekend, maybe you can take advantage of, um, you know, being taking a trip to an attraction that you haven't been to. Um, whatever it is, we just encourage you. We also would say that you can buy gift cards and you can redeem those at a later time if you're not comfortable doing any of this right now. That's understandable. So we um, just encourage that you might purchase gift cards that you can share with family and friends who might come into town at a later date or that you can... Um, enjoy at a later date when you are feeling more comfortable about being out. And then uh, lastly, I would say, please share it on social media. We get great engagement when folks see um, what people are up to. And it really is a huge lift to our partners who are feeling, um, feeling the crunch, feeling the challenge of what this current moment is presenting them. And so if we can just love on our local hospitality industry this holiday season, it will help so very much. Very Thanks. well said. Excellent. Uh, Wells. Well, I'm first going to do what Mary Quinn tells us to do, which is great. <laughs> so, um, I, uh, I think, I, I don't know, I think in summation, I guess I would say that um, uh, I've never been in Lexington for this long <laughs> time in my entire life um, in terms of I normally am traveling a lot and I've always traveled. And I think it makes me appreciate just uh, how special Kentucky really is. And so I just, I guess I would just encourage all of us, this is very hard, right? We're all doing really hard things in the midst of a time when many of us can't see our families or at least not up close or not inside. And, and we can't see our friends and our whole world is turned upside down. So I just, I've been leaning a lot on thinking about how to be empathetic and then also how to be as grateful as possible for, for what I have. And I think that that helps us all build resilience 
And I just, I guess I would just ask that all of us in Kentucky be kind to one another. I mean, it's on our flag, right? United we stand, divided we fall. So how do we work together to help each other and not just point out, you know, the things we don't like about what each other is doing or saying, and how do we do this together? I mean, how do we get through this? Because I really do believe uh, what the governor has been saying, which is we will get through this together. So that's yeah. all I would say. Excellent. Wallace. Yes, uh, I was busy writing down what Mary Quinn was saying there about, uh, you know, especially, uh, you know, about the uh, staycation and stuff. But I know my wife and I were just talking about, you know, what we're going to do as far as Christmas gifts this year. And we both was mentioning, you know, let's get some gift cards to some of these local restaurants. And that's something we did mention this morning as well. Um, but the one thing you also mentioned to do is, uh, you know, social media. So that's one thing we kind of try to start doing their office the last week or two, just kind of promote some small businesses to help, help support there as well. Um, you know, and like well said, just continue just to shop local, stay local. You know, I think we all can support each other local. I think that'll go a long way as far as making us a stronger community as well. Very good. Lenny? I, I think that one of the things, you know, the, the, the folks listening out here, we're all leaders in, in our respective communities. And, and without being Pollyanna, you know, I, I've really focused on communication and, and being frank and honest. But I, I think it's easy to, to sort of get caught up in the negative. And I think if we can find some of those positive things, and, and, and typically if you look, you can find something positive. Let's, let's not forget to celebrate some of the positive things that are going on. It, it's so easy to, to let some of that go by the wayside. It, and I at least find with my organization, it goes a long way. I mean, they get plenty of the negative and, and we don't hide anything, but yeah. make sure we don't forget to celebrate the wins because it's so easy to, to, to get sort of yes. downtrodden with all the crushing things going on in the world that, that the, the little wins sometimes mean so much to people. And, and I think we can all do that and, and go home and, and make sure that we find, find yeah. something positive to celebrate. Yeah. Well, to our listening audience, I would say this. You can now understand why we selected these four individuals. They are uh, cream of the crop. They are all stars here. And uh, quite frankly, um, the leadership you exhibited today gives a lot of people a lot of confidence. You're practical, but you're looking forward and uh, you're trying to figure out how to build a, a better Central Kentucky. So to the four of you, thank you very much. To all of our listeners and participants via uh, the digital uh, video conferencing of Zoom, uh, thank you very much for uh, joining us.